Welcome to the first Lend Books. I've done 200 plus Lend Talks based on lectionary, semiotics, and now I'm going to continue to do that, intersperse them with these Lend Books. And this is the backstory and the secret story of each one of the books that I've, I've published. I've published now over 70 books, so sometimes I'll be just be doing two or three books at once around a common theme. But today, we're going to start with my first book, and this is the book called Black Images of America, 1781 to 1870, the hardback, the paperback, published by W.W. W. Norton. I um, had been publishing, I've been encouraged, and the only way I could have done this, and I did this um, really when I was in my mid-20s, and I could only have done this um, with the encouragement of mentors. And I just want to say something about the importance of, of mentors as we begin. When I was in college, I went to the University of Richmond. I had an incredible exposure to, to American Christianity, to history of religions, to church history, to, to world history. By, by professors, um, professors like uh, John Rilling, uh, who taught me to, to really uh, look at the world history, and to Emery Bogle, who hosted uh, his seminars, and I took a, a couple seminars in African history with him, in his home. And he'd bring in food, and these big platters of appetizers and food, and we'd sit around in his home and and have a seminar and this was part of the inspiration for one of the things that i do and the sober mesa style of of teaching that i love and how my advance here at this house when we have two three four five day advances just one big sober mesa thank you emory bogle one of the best teachers i've ever i've ever had william harrison daniel who knew american religious history like the like the back of his hand and and who I never forget just every word he said I wanted to write down as fast as I could because um, it, he just had spent so much time working on his lectures. They were masterpieces. An incredible education, Richmond College, University of Richmond. And I, they encouraged me actually to have some papers published. And I ended up as a college student publishing some papers in historical journal, journals. Um, the historical magazine of the Protestant Episcopal Church. Now, these are not, you know, top-tier journals, but they're still uh, professionally refereed and significant uh, historical journals. And, and I would never have done that without this encouragement. Then I went to seminary. I chose the seminary partly because I wanted to go where Martin Luther King Jr. went. And these three seminaries, Colgate Rochester, Bexley Hall, Crozer, um, which is where he went, had merged and went all Rochester. He was in Chester, Pennsylvania when he went to Crozer, and Crozer merged and went to Rochester. And I got there the first semester, and you know, I wanted to get a PhD as well. My, but my major mentor, who um, became a surrogate father for me, his name was William Still Hudson, William S. Hudson, kind of the dean of American religious history, said to me, Len, you know, it's going to be three years of of seminary, another four years of a PhD. Why don't you just do both at once? I said, what? He said, yeah, you could do it. He said, um, you know, I, I'll, uh, I'll somewhat cover for you, but you can get a PhD at the University of Rochester and just don't tell them here at the seminary that you've enrolled in another degree program. So for two and a half years, I took 30 hours a semester. <laughs> and, and with his encouragement and his not telling, that I was in two degree programs at the same time. I was able to, um, to do this. And he, his, his comment to me was, now this is gonna sound sacrilege to some of you who hear this. He said, don't publish, don't write a dissertation, write a book. Because if you write a dissertation, you just gotta spend another year changing its dissertation diapers. So just write a book. And so I did. So this was actually accepted for publication before I, I got my PhD, and I got my PhD, my MDiv and PhD. Um, I was finished in four years, uh, where normally it would have taken me seven, but I would not have done that without William Still Hudson, his encouragement. 
Now, in I got caught up when I went to the University of Rochester in the PhD program. Not only was the the the, the whole African American uh, emphasis strong at Colgate Rochester Bexley Hall, but um, the the history department, the University of Rochester, um, at this time was kind of a heyday of African American studies, and you had you had people like Eugene Genovese, Roll Jordan Roll, got major multiple awards, um, including the National Book Award. Um, his wife, Elizabeth, Elizabeth Fox Genovese, a scholar of the American South and feminism, she laid, later critiqued the feminist movement as it was unfolding. Herbert Gutman, by the way, who was in a major um, dispute with, I never could figure out why they hated each other so much, Genovese and Gutman. But he was a labor historian who took, uh, who took at the African American experience seriously, and then uh, Perez Zagrin, Tudor and Stewart English historian that I just I just adored, and then the Cleo matrician Stanley Angerman, Stanley Angerman and uh, Robert Fogel wrote this Time on the Cross: The Economics of American Slavery. Um, and it was a huge uh, bombshell and got all sorts of awards. Um, so I got caught up in this and I got caught up in trying to understand the, the, um, the American experience of African Americans and, and the global experience of, of what it meant um, to have this kind of new form of racial slavery to come into the scene. I did have a, um, my mentor, and it was suggested to me by Wynne Hudson because he said he didn't have many PhD students and, and um, I he would kind of not over, um, over supervise me too much. His name was Milton Berman. And Milton Berman, really nice guy. Um, he was my doctoral advisor, but Something happened with him that changed me forever. And it wasn't a good thing at first, but it became the best thing. He got an early draft of my dissertation, Black Images of America. And he read it, looked at it, and he returned it back to me and he said, um, there's too many metaphors. He said, you got too many metaphors, you got too many stories in this. He said, um, and I'll never forget, metaphors are the ornamentation of thought. They have no, they do not belong in an academic dissertation. The highest form of reasoning is not metaphorical reasoning, but it is abstract reasoning. So you've got to make your language more abstract. Um, you've got to make your arguments more abstract and you've got to get rid of your metaphors or I'm not going to pass this. And I went back and I'm telling you one of the hardest things that I ever did in my entire life was to remove just strip away. It was like, you know, taking big patches of flesh um, to get rid of these metaphors and these narratives that I had tried to make this uh, book come alive more for the reader. But he was thinking for historians, I was thinking for, for the reader and just for a good storytelling. And I resolved after I did that, let me tell you, I resolved I will never do that again. I tried to argue that we also had one of our professors was Christopher Lash, his culture of narcissism, which uh, Jimmy Carter, when he was president, uh, Lash kind of became the president's favorite uh, author. He was at the White House a lot. And, and uh, Lash used stories and metaphors. And so I argued with Berman, but he said, but he's not a real historian. He's not a real historian. He's more of a cultural historian. Um, and then young, young emerging historians there, Ron Formazano, who I think is today even now head of the history department at the University of, uh, of uh, Kentucky. Mary Young uh, died a few years ago, but she featured, she, she featured Native American history in her scholarship. All these people, Abraham Karp, a Jewish historian, introduced me to, to the Jewish story. Um, they were using metaphors and, and stories. And I tried to argue with Milton Berman, but he was, um, he was a tell it like it is, V.S. Eigelant, Gavazinist historian. And so that's the, the backstory of my black images of America. I also wanna say that the other reason why I was really interested in 
African-American studies and the story of African-Americans in the, the, the American story is because when I, my freshman year at Colgate Rochester Divinity School, um, when I was 21, um, there was a professor there named James Ashbrook. He his field was psychology and religion. Now I was a hardcore theology, history, Bible person. And he was in that other D division, you know, where he had all the others, the miscellanies. But the requirement was you had to go through a introductory orientation course with him. And he put me, in, and they featured no exit relationships is what they were called. So he paired us together with somebody else and we had to get to know each other that first semester. He paired me with Edward Wheeler an African-American um, whose actually grandfather was from upstate New York, um, but he himself was from the South. Now he's from um, both the Adirondack Mountains, upstate New York, where his grandfather lived, and um, from West Virginia, but a part of West Virginia where Yankee was not just one word. So he put the two kind of opposites together in this no exit relationship. And Ed Wheeler and I, you know where we found... Um, our feet together and our friendship formed was not sitting at a table looking at one another and arguing things out. It was on the basketball court. And I'll never forget how the important that was for me to realize that sometimes, you know, getting down at a table and getting heavy or deep and real and trying to rationalize and argue with each other, um, I came to understand and he came to understand me. Both of us came to understand each other and have this lasting friendship. He became president of of Christian Theological Seminary. He was on the faculty. I brought him to the faculty when I was president of United. Um, he became head of inter uh, ITC um, in Atlanta. I mean, he just, um, and he also got his PhD in, in, uh, in, in, in historical theology from Emory. Um, but, we became, but I found a footing in a relationship with him that was formed and forged not as we looked at each other, but as we went side by side and played basketball together. And I'll never forget uh, the impact of, of that uh, discovery in my own life. Um, I, um, when I was at, at as, even as a college student, I was really felt honored, I mean, as a seminary student, I felt honored that there were some faculty still teaching there that had taught Martin Luther King Jr., Kenneth L. Smith, we call him Snuffy Smith. Um, he taught Martin Luther King Jr. theology. And I, um, I, he asked me if I would help him write some articles on the Chicago School of Theology. Uh, and I did, but four articles came from both of us while I was a seminary student and was published in the journal Foundations. So the, these these professors that were actually, there was kind of a, a sense of um, um, lineage, heritage, that I felt I was a part of with the King story. And to this day, I um, have spent my life collecting signed copies of some of the greatest African-American books that have been published. Here is a signed copy of W.E.B. Du Bois's The Souls of Black Folk. Here is a signed copy of Desmond Tutu's uh, Hope and, and Suffering. Here's a signed copy of Booker T. Washington's Up from Slavery. And then Howard Thurman, who was a graduate of Colgate Rochester himself, um, signed copies of the book that Martin Luther King Jr. Jr. kept with him all the time, Jesus and the Disinherited. Um, I love um, the Negro spiritual speaks of life and death, the story of, of slave spirituals. Here, a signed copy of one, Deep River, uh, which is um, the, um, another taking the, this further. A, uh, a signed copy, I love this one here. This is a beautiful published book uh, of some of his um, sermons preached at the Boston University Chapel. Howard Thurman, the number is 413, The Temptations of, of Jesus. And, and here's his life story. Um, some of these, by the way, I've 
the five extra copies, I put them up for sale on Abe Book. So you could actually buy one of my, some of my signed copies. Here's With Heart and Head, his autobiography, um, and a, a signed copy um, by him, Howard Thurman. So my, my interest in, in looking at including everybody in the story um, began here with and is reflected in my first book, Black Images of America. I, I've mentioned this, I don't know if you've heard of it before, but um, the um, king was asked once in his lifetime to teach a course. And the course was entitled Social Philosophy, and King taught it, co-taught it with Samuel Williams, who was professor of philosophy at Morehouse. And the president of Morehouse, Benjamin Mays, asked King, just, we need to get our students involved in your movement. We need to introduce them to you. You need to, you owe this to your alma mater. Just come back. So for the academic year, 1959-1960, King came and offered once in his life a course a college course and became a professor. And King co-taught it, as I said, with Sam Williams. And when the students signed up, there was nine of them, I think, if I'm correct, who, who signed up. Now think of a King were teaching a course at your church or at the college that you graduated from um, how many would sign up? You know, sometimes God gives us a moment and we miss it. Sometimes greatness passes by and we miss it. And it's only later, oh, did not our hearts burn within us when he, it's not in the moment when he's doing it, it's later. Oh, wow, wasn't that special? And here you had nine students. Um, now, some of them I know personally, Pratia Hall Wynn, who actually, and King credited her with the I Have a Dream refrain. It started off in a prayer, and she started that a prayer with that refrain. I hired her, by the way, to be one of the preaching professors at United Theological Seminary when I was president. Um, Amos Brown, who is still alive and thriving. Um, Julian Bond, who passed away a few years ago. John Lewis, who just recently... Um, you know these names. These were his students. Now, um, the, um, the students who are still alive, who, taught, who studied with him, are the only people in the world that can say, I was a student of Martin Luther King Jr. He was my professor. I was mentored personally by him academically. Um, so they're a select group, and they know they're a select group, and they get together periodically, those that are still around. But at the same time, they congratulate each other on their good sense in taking the course. Okay. They also wring their hands because even though they showed up, they still missed it. Not one of them saved the syllabus. Not one of them got a picture. Not one of them got an autograph. Not one of them. He passed back papers that he graded. Not one of them saved one of those papers where his... His, his uh, edit, editings and notations were in the margins. Um, so even though you can show up, you can still miss it, the fullness of that, of that moment. The syllabus for Martin Luther King Jr.'s social philosophy included readings from some of the greatest thinkers of political theory, John Stuart Mill, Hegel, Rousseau, Socrates, Plato. And the final exam posed the question of whether Adam Smith or Karl Marx would support the nonviolent theory of social change, which he learned, by the way, from E. Stanley Jones in his reading of um, E. Stanley Jones' the story of Gandhi, the Christ of the Indian Road. And um, it's amazing how influence, influence works. Um, so this is the story, the backstory. Um, this, this writing this shaped to me because from then on, you got metaphors and you got stories, you got narratives, and this, the backstory of this is why um, um, you're getting it because I could not find myself as hard. It was the hardest thing I've ever written, 
is his dissertation to make it as abstract uh, as I as I possibly could. The other thing I learned when this came out, the first review, um, American Historical Review, the guy loved it, thought it was fantastic. One of the number one African American historians. The Journal of the American History, the the guy. Um, basically gave it a C. He didn't think there was anything special in it and um, didn't take the conversation much further than it had already been brought. And so I got a, from one reviewer an A, another reviewer a C, and I realized at that point, um, when you become an author, you put your head in a guillotine and some people um, will, um, will take it off. Um, now, he didn't take it off completely. I mean, basically, I got to see. But still, um, if you're afraid of criticism, um, maybe you, when you write, you ought not to put your, 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 maybe you ought to consider whether you want, really want to write or not, because you're really putting it all out there. You're making yourself really vulnerable. And um, I am who I am today. My interests, um, we had the, the largest African-American ministries, doctoral ministry program that I did with Sam Proctor, just brought him in, Daryl Ward and Mary. Um, she, she, these, these two people really um, helped to uh, shape this thing with me. And we were graduating almost more doctoral students who were African-American than we were in the top five in the country um, when this was going on. And so I, I really um, uh, have been shaped by this story and my interest in issues of African-American studies and African-American, the whole African-American experience um, have, have, been, have been determined by this, um, this initial destiny. The other thing was and I, I don't, I don't, I would be remiss if I didn't mention this. Is that my mother, Mabel Bog Sweet, insisted that we bring African Americans into our home and go into their homes. And so my mother cultivated African American friendships at the cost of a lot of. Um, her uh, social cachet, but she insisted that um, one in particular, her name was Melvina, that Melvina became really almost her best friend. And, and we went into Melvina's home, we ate together, and we, we played together as kids with her kids. And so from v very early on, the sense that in Christ there is neither um, Greek nor Jew, rich or poor, slave or free. We are all one in Christ, and we are all equal. Um, There's a powerful lesson that I think percolated throughout my life, beginning with mother's insistence that you're going to have African-American friends, even on an all-white street that we grew up on. So the backstory, my first book, Black Images of America, 1781 to 1870. I really feature here Frederick Douglass, and I have no, nothing signed by Frederick Douglass. I've been trying to get one all my life, and I still haven't, haven't enabled, uh, been able to do it. But thank you for listening to me and for uh, letting me tell you a little bit about the backstory of my first publication.